IUCN, IWA, etc., are partner to this new initiative. With that, I thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you, you now see why I've spent my career in radio and not on television. <laughs> my friends have for years told me I had a brilliant face for radio. <laughs> um, I had the privilege of chairing a round table which examined the opportunities for business, in particular the building business, presented by climate change. I spent a fascinating 60 minutes. I'm not sure how the audience felt, but if they felt anything like I did, they would have left there fulfilled, which was the main thing. And for that, I'd like to thank a group of seven people who were very generous with their time and their skill and their expertise. So thank you to them if they're in this audience. The agenda that we used was short because time was, but we started by looking at the opportunities, not only for big companies, but an area that interests me in particular, the smaller companies, the newer companies, the fresh talent that's coming onto this market all the time. And we discussed who the opportunities were for, who could take advantage of them, what in particular were the opportunities? Where was, if you like, the low-hanging fruit? Where in the world were those opportunities? And when would the market reach a pitch and how long would it last? We talked about the obstacles presented to builders and those connected to the building trade. We talked about the resources that they required, the role of governments, the need for leadership, and most importantly, the impetus that the sector requires in order to make a big next step. That is not to decry the progress that's been made so far. The conclusions, in no order of importance, were were these. First of all, impetus would be provided by a rise in fuel prices. Not the most popular conclusion. I remember the chaos that was caused in the UK not long ago when fuel prices rose to what the public thought was unacceptable levels. Another conclusion was the need for lots of experimental projects in the world of climate proofing. There were two arguments about this. Was it right to focus on two or three big projects, or was it right to proceed with a number of experimental projects on the basis that let's make all our errors now? Incubating small companies, encouraging the entrepreneurs of this world who are going to be there replacing, dare I say it, most of us over the next 20 years. How do we encourage them? How do we give them the knowledge, the management skills, the entrepreneurial skills, and most importantly, the funding to take that step, to take the risk? Making climate proofing sexy. I have to say, as a journalist, the jargon and the language of those involved in the climate proofing industry is not exactly sexy, you know. And I really urge you to spend a little time, if I may be so bold, to thinking about the language that you use. The extraordinary thing is that this is a huge market. And after a few minutes of this round table, an astonishing fact emerged. Real interest to small companies. In Holland, I'm told, there are around about 1.4 million homes that need retrofitting. The biggest supplier of retrofitting 
in Holland has only the resources to manage 4,000 homes a year. I see a market opportunity there. I really urge anyone in this audience who's got a small building company to start looking for the right labor to take advantage of that opportunity because one of the observations that were made was that there are lots of people at the higher stratospheric echelons of climate change talking about policy, rules and regulations, government initiatives, but there are not enough people at the practical do it, roll your sleeves up end to take advantage. Now, if there are any members of a building union in this audience, I would urge you to start thinking about starting courses for youngsters to learn that particular trade. Over and above all, though, what was clear was, I suppose, a little obvious, that in order for the building trade, architects, designers, technocrats, bricklayers, to get stuck into this market, there has to be a good chance of profit. And profit, in some circles, is a d dirty word. In my circles, it's a good word. There has to be a good chance of profit. And that depends on a whole number of factors. I had a really great time this morning. It's been a real privilege and a pleasure for me. And I thank you for inviting me to be with you. Good afternoon. Can you see me? I think I'm vertically or challenged. I can barely see over the, um, over the top of the desk. So um, I was given the privilege of uh, chairing the Role of Cities Roundtable. Um, there were representatives from Jakarta, New Orleans. Um, yeah, okay, from New Orleans, uh, from Ho Chi Minh City, uh, from, uh, from your own city, Rotterdam and from Toronto, and it was a great privilege to be with them there. Um, at our session, there was one overriding and dynamic message, and that was, act now. And they were the words of uh, Jakarta's governor, Mr. Fauzi Bawal, when he was asked, what was the most important message that he would take home from this conference? He just said two words, which was, act now. And he was, I have to say, wholeheartedly supported by the host mayor, your own mayor here in Rotterdam, Mr. Ahmed Abu Taleb, who warned that Mother Nature will not wait. And the panelists agreed that the central governments of all of their countries would not move fast enough to protect their Delta cities. Delta cities, they decided, must look after themselves. Cedric Grant, who is the deputy mayor of New Orleans, uh, and during our session we saw a very graphic um, film of the impact uh, of climate change on these Delta cities. And most of you may remember having seen the pictures on the television of people holding up signs and waving for help in New Orleans. It's perhaps one of the most graphic uh, natural disasters that we've all seen. Uh, Cedric Grant said that it was a local issue that these cities must look after themselves also. And he said strategies adopted by New Orleans would be handed to the people of New Orleans so that large numbers of the citizens would work on projects that would protect them and their city from future disasters. And he felt that takes it back to the heart of the city again. And your mayor here in Rotterdam, uh, Mayor Abu uh, Taleb, said that he wanted Rotterdam's future economy to be a green economy where there were as many people working on environment projects as there were in ev any other sector of the city, and in that way, you maintain ownership uh, of environmental issues. And the panelists agreed um, with Rotterdam's mayor that the cost of environmental planning and strategy was not a social cost, which is how it seems to be regarded, but it was an investment. But the question arises from all of this is, do Delta cities have the ability, the resources, the knowledge and the technical and fiscal know-how and skills to act alone? And the answer is probably that they do not, not alone. And so an alliance of Delta cities where historical experiences and